So, we're now going to have a presentation from Jeff Hayward. Um, Jeff is the uh, Pro Vice Chancellor, no, Vice Principal in, in Scotland for Digital Education. And he asked me to say that he predates computers, not just the web. <laughs> Over to you, Jeff. Well, thank you very much for the invitation, and I do indeed predate computers. Not in the sense of the invention of computers, but I do remember doing everything on paper, and there was a computer somewhere within the university in which I worked. So, so I'm, I'm very, very, very much an immigrant in some senses. But, of course, in lots of respects, we're all immigrants and we're all natives. It, it's been interesting listening to the talks this morning, and, and, and I was... I was looking across the theme of what's been talked about and, and also what's coming up. And, and, and the word change, in some respects, is everywhere in it. And, and, and I was just talking to Alison now about the, the significant challenges that's faced by you as a group. And I say you because I've kind of stepped back a wee bit from it. But actually, us in the sense that we're, we're responsible for the systems and the way that universities and colleges run things, there's a real challenge in the, in the two very different sorts of messages that came from Ava and, and from Alison at the beginning. Because one of them is a message that says, hey guys, this, and gals, sorry, it's not a gendered word. Um, all of this stuff is unraveling. It's coming to pieces and, and, and uh, the way things will be in the future is going to be radically different from the way it is now. And I guess all of us in some sense believe that there's degrees of truth in that. Whereas Alison actually described very clearly the challenge that one has as a national higher and further education system to make sure that it runs well now and in the coming few years. The attempt to, um, to encompass and understand what's going on so that those people who are participants in it in all their different ways can deal with it. And those two forces in a sense are in, are in, are in polarization to each other. One of them saying, saying it's coming apart and the other one saying we need to manage it better. And, and, and I was saying to Alison that, that the challenge for the people in this room and, and colleagues across the sector is how do they do both of those things at the same time? How do they encompass change and at the same time make everything as it runs better? And I think that, that, that one of the, um, the things that I've learned and I've spent quite a lot of time over the last year or so working on, and I have 2025 in everything these days, and uh, you know, in a year or two it will move to 2030. Uh, I have a set of slides that do 2020 and 2015, and it's quite interesting occasion for you to reflect on them to see um, what, what, what I was saying at that time. But the only things that you can do is to try to figure out what to sensibly do in a time span of about 10 years, accepting that, that some things will come from left field, because it's a period of time in which we can work forward. I'm very sceptical about analyses that say in 2050. And I think it was Bill Gates who, who, who said one of the things that I, I try to remember every time I start doing the future stuff, and, and I think it's Bill Gates who said that we overestimate the short term and we underestimate the long term. And 10 years is short term, I think, in this kind of thinking. And so the critical thing is not to get phased by um, the changes that will come, but not to forget that those changes will come and not therefore say, hey guys, the futurists were wrong, it wasn't like that, because it probably will be, it's just later. Than, than they tend to predict. I'm going to talk about post-compulsory education. So I'm going to try mostly to talk about education and higher education and further education. It is a bit higher education oriented, but actually I feel that all of those boundaries are blurring out. And so actually the distinctions that we have are uh, increasingly slipping away. And I suppose that, that in answer to my question, and so I'll give you a sense, it's the punchline before I start, what does one do about this difficult changing world and the reality of now and an uncertainty about the pace of change is it's got to come down to an agile mindset. It's got to come down to openness and sharing. And it's got to come down to serious experimentation, i.e. not just fiddling around with small stuff, but trying big stuff seriously. And alongside that, of course, um, the, preparedness, um, the preparedness to fail. 
So the, 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 the caveat emptor stuff up front, technologies are not in vacuum, they are socially shaped. And they do arise in response to need and are used in response to need. And we've seen that over the last years um, as people have adopted uh, the opportunities that, that, that have been made available by the emergence of Web 2.0, Web 3.0 sorts of tools around. And it's, you know, it's a truism that by 2025 there will be technologies that we cannot predict today. Although my very last slide is actually a prediction of all the things that I think we should keep an eye on as we go through um, but there is of course a, a, a very big question mark ar uh, sitting around that so one of the one of the ways to try to think about 2025 which in some senses seems a terribly long way off is actually to go back 10 years and although you can't extrapolate linearly across time looking back to 20 to, looking back to 2005 from here in lots of respects Many things in higher and further education have not really changed a terribly large amount. And indeed, one of the discomforts I think that people have with looking at higher and further education is that sense that it hasn't changed and, and it actually remains um, in, at least um, on the surface, appears to be uh, relatively the same. Back in 2005, I think we would have said that mobile was existing, whereas now it's just everything and everywhere. Data was something that was mostly for people who were quite technical or geeky, and now data are actually for everyone around. Fully online education, apart from perhaps in the open universities, fully online education was something that some people believed was important but for many people it was just not on their agenda at all it wasn't a, a strongly discussed topic whereas now I think it's actually treated as something which is inevitable uh, in some shape or form within within higher and further education outsourcing or cloud again not keeping stuff to yourself was something worth thinking about, whereas now I think for many of us it's actually become the default. And I think, interestingly, in a personal sense of what you do yourself, and this is important in higher education and, and clearly less true in the public sector, the cloud is, is for many people now, absolutely the default. And, and there's, there's a big mindset shift there that's occurred. So although in lots of ways you can walk around colleges and universities and see all of the same stuff, underneath it there has been a significant amount of change in the way people do their everyday teaching, research and administrative businesses. And one of the challenges for the sector is that that is not particularly well perceived and I'll, 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 I'll come back to a comment about that um, in, in a couple of minutes. So looking forward then to 2025, what sorts of things are we going to have to take account of? What are the kinds of things that we're likely to see coming through that we are going to have to be agile and open and prepared to adapt to and prepared to experiment with? And of course you could draw a huge list and so what I've done is, is to draw a relatively limited slide. I mean I actually started with a list of all of the things I thought were important and you couldn't put them on a readable slide and so this is, this is my my personal selection of the things that, that I think that we are going to have to take account of over the next 10 years um, and a few of them I will talk about in a little bit more detail and some of them I won't but some of them I think are quite significant even though I won't and so I'll, I'll mention mobility the P and the V stand for physical and virtual in other words physical mobility the movement of staff and the movement of students so it applies to both, it's not just students. Physically and virtually, in other words, working in another place, studying another place, while still staying at your, in, your, in your own place, I think is going to increase substantially over the coming years. We know that at least for research, very research active academics, they are very mobile in this sense already. But in a teaching sense, that's much less true. 
There are the visiting lectures and the flying lectures. There are occasionally the remote seminars and things. But I think that this is going to become much more of a norm. Where your staff are and where your students are is going to become a harder thing to know. It's going to become a harder thing to measure and encompass in, in statistics. I think that the industry engagement and the knowledge transfer, knowledge exchange, the relationship between higher and further education and industry is going to rise. And it's going to rise partly because it's strongly on government agendas, strongly on the European agendas, but also I think it would be increasingly in our interests to do that because many of the things that we will find difficult to do in higher and further education, we will find being done in what is a burgeoning start-up educational technologies um, industry. And although it's not terribly strong here north of the border, although we do as a university and our principal touts it around, have a map of all the startups in Edinburgh of that kind, Skyscanner and all of that, actually it's terribly strong when one goes down into the southeast. And I was really brought, brought to my attention in a very strong way in the workshop I went to at Biz that was full of people who ran these small educational technology oriented startups and working with those startups I think is part of the answer to our agility and it's part of the answer to our experimentation. And then another one which I think will be significant for us and, and it will be difficult for our systems I think to be changed and to encompass this is this move away from measurement of time spent in an institution by, by learners to progression metrics and to learning gains. And I know that from conversations with funding councils, and you see it in the States, that the interest is shifting from time spent to outcome and the value added that one's made from the start to when, whatever that is to the end. And measurements of those kinds will actually challenge us, I think, quite significantly to, th to think about what is it that we're measuring what is it that we capture and how, and how do we reflect that back? So, I'm going to talk for a short while about the search for a new education. And I said, I'll talk mostly about education, but I'll come back into research because I think it's significant. And, and I just picked these two images, one of them that comes from the European Commission and its high-level group on the modernization of higher education, which I'm... Um, particularly sensitive to at the moment because I'm doing a piece of work for the European Commission in that area of trying to understand what system level changes could be made within Europe that would produce a new higher and further education and the ETAG that comes out of the further education sector and um, capturing of that sort of thinking about innovation, deeping, deepening and accelerating learning and keeping it fun um, and empowering teachers and learners, which is a very different model, I think, if you take it seriously to the way that we do our stuff now. And so over the next few years, we will see an increasing desire by governments and by European Commission. We see it in the States, we see it in China, we see it in the Gulf, we see it in France. All countries are trying to work out how to develop a higher education system in the learning and teaching area, how to generate one which is fit for purpose for the 21st century. So this, the ability of our systems to find new and better ways of delivering a relevant higher education will stay on the political agenda. There was a, a kind of turbocharge that arrived as a consequence of MOOCs, but it was there before that and it will continue even if MOOCs actually, and indeed as MOOCs do, fade out of, 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 of the hype. So we aren't going to see that political desire for change and modernization to go away. That doesn't mean to say that loads of money will follow, but, but there will be an agenda and a policy agenda which is set up which will drive us towards rethinking the way we do our learning and teaching. And there's a big consequence then for all of the systems and the ways that we, that we run things across the institution. And indeed a challenge for many of the commercial organizations um, that supply us with, with the tech and, and, the, and, and the software that we use. I was particularly struck by this Horizon report. And, and Horizon reports have, have always been sort of kind of useful. They come from um, new media in, in the US. 
there have been a list of technologies and they've always said this is going to come next year and this is going to come in three or five years and this is further down and I've never believed them and I've always sort of put them in a line and I felt actually this feels just a bit hodgepodgey. I, I don't think those things are going to go like this. But in this particular report, this 2014 report, and although they refer to higher education, I think actually strictly it's about both, they put down quite interestingly the things that actually face us and, and the lines under which they put them, solvable, difficult and wicked, I think is particularly interesting. And I think the first one, perhaps, solvable, those that we understand and know how to solve, I thought was a wee bit optimistic. But it is interesting that they picked on faculty, i.e. on teachers, but actually the truth is that that applies to students too, regardless of the digital native, digital immigrants. In other words, we don't really have digital fluencies in our institutions that are strong enough to support a move into a learning and teaching environment which is substantially different to the one we've got. Rewards for teaching has been there forever um, and, and indeed actually there will um, undoubtedly actually one of the recommendations we will make to the European Commission is that that is one of the real stumbling blocks. But I think that looking down that list and looking at the bottom, the very last one, keep, keeping education relevant. How do we define what that relevance is? Because if you are to change the system, and if it is to become different to the one now, you need to understand what it is it is going to do. And if we cannot define what that is, then we have a real difficulty as planners and as leaders in trying to work out how to take ourselves forward. And the relevance of education is one of the problems that I think is particularly difficult in terms of what I call the tyranny of the curriculum. In other words, we have curricula, we have designed ways of doing education that are tightly interlocked and the challenge for us there is can we unpick the way that we do that learning and teaching, are there ways that we can do that such that we can find the space and the capacity um, to increase the relevance of what we do. I've got that stuck on my wall. It's, it's something that, that I look at every, every now and again and it reminds, it's a sobering thing when you get too carried away by the hype, as I often do when talking about MOOCs. Um, one, of the, one of the questions that, that has largely not been addressed in the area of higher education and, and with the um, the burgeoning of the use of technology and, and the appearance of MOOCs was, was no different. It's, it's summed up, I think, really neatly by Bill Bowen and his Tanner lecture, which is available online, is well worth reading. It's not, it's not terribly long, but it's a very interesting reflection on, on higher education and technology. Bill Bowen is a higher education economist um, uh, from, from the US with long experience. And I think that actually what he encapsulates in that is actually what most people in the political system and indeed perhaps even in the general public think when they look at higher and further education. They say that the things that we have done in terms of introduction of technology have not shown up in measures of productivity or in measures of reduced cost per student. Now, whether you believe it's true or not, I think that what he says there is actually a very commonly held view. And you see plenty of graphs which show the impact of technology on different sectors and education is always one of the worst in terms of changes in productivity as a consequence. I think it's interesting that he made that comment in 2012 at the end of a period in which universities and colleges in the States had, in, in, had invested enormous amounts of money in their IT infrastructures. Enterprise resource planning was something that very many of them went into and invested substantial amounts. And, and the question then is, is, did that produce increases in productivity or was it just that they didn't produce increases in productivity in the places that were visible. And if I think about my own university over this last 10 year period, I don't think we could have coped with the numbers of students, with the complexities we brought in, increasing numbers of masters, online masters, all sorts of things, ramping up a research. We could not have done that 
without the investment in the technology systems. But again, that's a relatively invisible thing. I don't think our teachers could have coped with the, with the changes in classes without the learning technologies that we put in. But it's wound up in the public domain as relatively invisible. So we have a visibility problem there that the measures that people look for are actually not necessarily the, the ones that have actually taken place and indeed the ones that have taken place are not necessarily the ones that they actually find particularly compelling. So there's a, there's a public perception question there. So let's, let's take a look at some of the possibilities over the next few years to try to find some ways to change the things that will come in and the things that we can adapt to and the things that we can use that might help us to, to change the way we do higher and further education. And the first one that I've got there, data-based research for all, and I mean for all, I think is going to be one of the significant opportunities that we actually have to grasp higher and further education. You sit online and you just sit simply Googling, saying, online application to do X, and you pick almost anything you like, and you find things out there for free that allow you to do those things. You can do your own social network analysis if you like. You can pull data out of Twitter. You can get a plug-in for Excel. You can load it up online, and it will come out with those gorgeous diagrams of network analysis, all beautifully colored in. Anybody can do social network analysis. You can buy yourself at really surprisingly low prices, high performance computing ability, storage ability. Data sets are increasingly becoming available. And so as a consequence, your ability as a learner, as a teacher, as a researcher, to use that set of tools to do research where you never were able to do it before, I think is one of the real burgeonings that we're beginning to see. And so the question is for us as institutions is, how do we engage with that? How do we bring that in to our daily business? How do we, if we are providers centrally, what do we do about providing cloud computing and cloud storage for all of our teachers and all of our students? And then how do we use that to build the skills that they need, quantitative reasoning, the ability to code, data wrangling, presentation, visualization. Those are parts of the 21st century skill set for graduates from our universities and our colleges. So those opportunities sit there right now. And the question is, in the next year, what do we do about it? How do we engage with that and, and begin to make it? begin to make it work. And then sitting along the back of that, and, and this is a slide that I've, that I've taken from talking about research data management, so those who have heard me talk about it will recognize it, but it was only actually when I was sitting looking at it on the bus down this morning that I realized it actually said two different things, because I have built this slide as meaning what are universities going to do about the big research data that they hold? But actually the picture on the left isn't a university, that is personal. That is about a teacher and a, and, and a pupil, if you like. It's about us and our data. And in a more devolved world, where not in public sector perhaps, but in our sector, where people carry mobile devices and they bring their own stuff, how are we going to help them, as part of our enterprise, create, document, use, share, preserve? the data that they are generating and they are manipulating on, on our behalf. And so protecting that digital world and maintaining that digital world and having it available so that it can be drawn upon by others uh, and, and drawn upon by ourselves, I think is another of the big challenges and has to sit alongside the first one about, about data-driven uh, research uh, um, and, and about inquiry learning. And then bring your own technology. And, and, and I guess if you were the captain of the Titanic, this is a mega threat. But actually, from my perspective, I see this as an enormous opportunity. Our learners and our staff bring a huge amount of tech that we do not need to provide. And they have access to and they use a huge amount of open 
and available technologies that we do not have to buy, procure, manage, version, and all of that stuff. And so actually they're bringing us a bounty that we would be foolish if we ignored or we excluded or actually perhaps what we're more likely to do is to be passive and to ignore the fact that they do that. One of the interesting studies that we did in Edinburgh um, a couple of years back and it shows in a sense our lack of understanding of, of what students did was in engineering where the students were asked to do project work and so they were set a task and they had to go away and do it and, and and it, a new member of staff came in and realized they had no idea how they did it because they provided no facilities for them. They just had no idea how they did it. And the reality was that in the background, those students were running their own applications, their own stores, their own communication tools. They were even dealing with issues of ethics and accessibility for those students who didn't want to have a Facebook account they actually found workarounds so in the background the students were the bottom of the iceberg they were actually making all of this stuff work independently and unknown to those who were actually running the courses and teaching and indeed even more unknown to those who are running central systems now to be honest about it some of the things they were doing were not legal but on the other hand, we all do stuff all the time that's not legal um, in, in to various shapes and forms. They were workarounds and they worked. And some of them were about interpretations about intellectual property and things. And I haven't acknowledged where I got that slide from. So in some respects, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, no, I'm no different. But the question for us then is, how do we capitalize on that 90%? How do we actually make that work so that it works for us actively across the board and bring in what they use and to support it without feeling the need to own it and, and to provide it. And I suppose actually, and I'm conscious it's been streamed, but, but, but I'll say it anyway, and, and also at the same time not to get too hung up about whether it is strictly legal and accept that, that everybody operates the way they, they see they need to operate to get the job done that they want to get done. So I see accepting and working with bring your own technology and seeing it as a major, a huge bonus, a massive Christmas present to, uh, to higher and further education as being one of the, uh, the significant things for us to pick up in the next year or two. And then there's open and of course in some respects some of the things that I've talked about already have been about open. Open is going to grow. I was a skeptic about open a few years ago. I, I thought, yeah, theoretically open, it's all right, you know, but it isn't really going to take off. And I have changed my mind about that. And it is about critical mass. But it's, it's also about mindset that, in a sense, one actually is moving into a world where open is becoming accepted as normal and by default, and that's particularly true, therefore, for us in, in, in higher and further education, that we need openness. And the openness, some of it's there about is, is data, some of it's about education in the sense of MOOCs, some of it which you see coming through and I think will be increasingly important is on the right-hand side of the slide there, the open virtual laboratories, the open tools, and this is not just in science and technology, not just in computer science, and I think actually in reality, in humanities and social sciences, there is much more of this stuff that you can do out there openly than there is actually in the science areas. And the other is to, is to capture within what we do the burgeoning field of citizen science. The ability to bring others in, and MOOCs are one of the areas that have taught us that, but Galaxy Zoo is another, and you know, there are plenty of, of examples in the humanities of people working collaboratively on old documents. You can bring other people into what you do. You can get scale, and you can get um, an experience of working in, in a different context. So I think that, that for that, and if we don't take that positively and seriously, it will be happening anyway and our students will be doing it and perhaps what Emma is saying is that as students move into this kind of world the disparity between that world and what we provide in a traditional setting will increase even more. 
The badging, I don't know whether, whether badging will become a significant threat to degrees, but it may become a significant threat in some areas of our business around vocation, around skills, and actually perhaps around um, continuing professional development. So, I said that I would come to the end and I would talk about, foolishly, having said that one shouldn't predict the future, about some of the technologies that I do see coming through that I think we need to watch. Because what I've looked at so far in a sense are systems and, and, and um, availabilities. But I think that there are some technologies around that will, if they, if they grow over the next 10 years, in significant scale and in usability will have a significant impact actually on all of us personally as well as, as, well as, as, as in, in the education business. Security is the top one because I think the amount of attention that we as individuals and we as organizations pay to security um, is just going to rise and rise. And I suspect as a consequence of that, and it goes back to what I said at the beginning about technologies arise where there's need and they get used where there is need, that that, that increasing consciousness, personally and organisationally, about security may well change the way we do uh, online security and, and the way that we think about it. And, and so I think that that is likely to be a, a burgeoning area that we can help our own staff and students come to grips with as it changes. Ubiquity of the fast internet certainly within the UK, although sitting on a train from here to Glasgow and losing all connectivity at about some point, some point as you go over the hill in the middle, you do occasionally wonder, and I catch the train a lot to London, and I just don't bother, I just look at the sea as I go down the, the, the Northumberland coast, but, but, but it is shifting, and, and shifting quite quickly because of demand. Mobile everything and wearables, we can see some of those things beginning to come through now, they, are, they have some strange uh, consequences sometimes. I went to a very interesting talk of somebody who, talking of, who, who wired the whole of his house and it was the toilet rolls and the use of toilet rolls that was actually the most striking, uh, interesting in two ways, actually because of the patterns, because it really brought home the intrusiveness of monitors on everything. In, 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 a, in a strange kind of way was quite discomforting. So, so, although I think it will come, we as institutions will need to think quite hard about it. And actually, the, the Google glasses and the constant helmets on bikes and all of that stuff are part of that kind of movement. And we will have to think quite carefully, institutions, how we use it. Um, so, mobile and everything and the Internet of Things and instrumentation, um, huge opportunities because you'll be able to monitor and gather data from all, all over, tsunami of data which will be hard to deal with, but also significant privacy and, and, and ethical issues sitting around it. The ability to find and, and digitize, find materials, digitize materials on demand, I think is inevitably going to grow. And the searches that we do at the moment, 10 years from now, will be significantly different to the sorts of searches that we do at the present time, uh, even though they are getting sub substantially better. Intelligent agents, I mean, intelligent agents have been around for a long time, and I've, I've done work a long time ago on that, and, and AI was going to change the world. And we are beginning to see, I think, a resurgence of people of saying, at some point, computers will become cleverer than us, and therefore, um, there are real problems with that. I think they're more likely to be in terms of helping us to do some of the things that we need to go to go back to Bill Bowen's point, to do at scale. An, an example would be, for instance, if one were running large classes or were run, running large amounts of instrumentation and you had something as intelligent as you that could look after it and manage it, that would set you free to do the other things that would be more useful. So perhaps in, we will see creeping in more use of intelligence to help us to increase the efficiency and the effectiveness of what we do. I've talked about data-driven world and personalization in a sense is, is, is embedded in, in, in also in some of the things I said. So I'll come to that bottom panel. Video and audio are easier than text. It's quite interesting at the moment that how much one actually still types on funny little keyboards and wikis and blogs and twitters and all of these things, we still tap away with fingers and get RSI and thumbs for those who do it a lot. 
But at a certain point in time, sending video and audio will be easier than sending it by text. So what does that mean then for all of the systems we have at the moment that are text-based? How will we move into thinking about representing and managing that world in which it's rich media we are flicking to each other as easily as we might send an email or might send a text? Couple that with speech recognition, and you can see speech recognition gaining significantly. I have used this for a long time. When I got my first speech recognition software, I tried to train it for weeks and weeks, and at a certain point it said to me, Strong regional accents may not be recognized, I thought, <laughs> up yours. But, it, but actually, they don't do that now. They don't do that now. We are beginning to move to a point at which machines can recognize speech without having been trained. And the demand for that, not in higher education, but the demand worldwide, socially, and in business, in all sectors, will drive increasing power into making that speech recognition work. So therefore, as a consequence, you will just be able to talk and it will convert it to text, or text it will convert it to speech. But with the next one of real-time translation and translators again, there's an enormous drive in the world for languages to be interreadable. The problem, English will not actually, in a world like that of real-time translation, there may not be a dominant language in the sense that there is now. Because just like Star Trek, you can actually listen to it spoken in Chinese and it will come to you, hopefully in an ungarbled and intelligible form of, form of English. You couple those together and lots of the things that we do now, lots of the things that we think about as being difficult now, collaboration internationally, all of that kind of stuff, would actually change radically. The next one, and that's the Star Trek um, Princess Leia at the bottom, digital physical co-presence, the ability to beam yourself into a room. When you do a telecon now, and there's video, they're on a big screen at the other end, or you know, a set of screens around you. But really, you would want them sitting in the seat next to you. And you would want to get away from the problem we have about they're out there, and they aren't really part of it, and so therefore they don't feel part of it, and you can't include them very easily. If you broke that so that the people appeared to be with you within the room, that would completely transform the way that we think about running collaboratively on long-distance meetings and classes in just the same way as Skype has changed people's views about just calling each other long distance and seeing each other at the same time so that people just sit and chat to their family in the airport with Skype on and they can see each other. A few years ago, in a sense, that was unthinkable. So that combination, I think, as they come through over the next 10 years, will have a really powerful effect on us. Social internet, mass crowdsourcing, I, I, I won't really say any more about that and I'll... I'll I'll just stop on the last one. I cannot work out 3D printing as to whether it's going to turn our world upside down or it's just a funny thing. But I do note the price is coming down and I do note that you can now get lots more designs than just how to make uh, a metal detector free gun, which is actually all you used to be able to get when they first came out. That, that I, it may well be that, interesting, we will move into a world in which you create your own objects and create your own objects within higher education, not just in art and design and sculpture and the sciences, but just everywhere. We just think, I'll print one in the way that we think, I'll just print a copy now. And I, I cannot work out what the impact of that will be, but I suspect that that may be one of the ones that will actually come through and, and we, will, we will feel the effect of quite significantly. Uh, not least in the fact that there will be billions and billions of small plastic objects washing up on our beaches um, that people have discarded. And, and so on that point, and I'm conscious of the time, I'll stop. I'm happy to take any questions. I'll be around over lunch. Thank you. Okie okay, doke. No. Any Here, questions? The future was just too much for you all, was it? No, lunch is too close. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, there's a question over there. Oh. 
the back. Thank you. Uh, it's just a comment about video, really, as being taken over from text. One of the things around video is that it's a relatively time inefficient way of getting lots of information in. So I'm skeptical that it will take over. And certainly we all walk around with phones with the ability to have video conferences over 3G now. And what do people do? We text. Though there is a cultural distinction there because I see East Asian students on campus doing video calls back home. So I'm not sure how that's going to play out. But I, I'm not convinced that that's the way it's going to go. I mean I, I mean, I think that you're right that the, the, the ability to do audio video as easily as to do text doesn't necessarily mean that text dis would disappear. Actually, in the sense that any, any changes that come through that disrupt or shift the balance don't necessarily eliminate other ways of doing things. Um, and there is a, a value lots of times in being able to send a text thing because it doesn't show anybody where you are or what you look like or whatever. So there are lots of reasons and you can multitask. In just the same way actually as, as many times people run Skype, audio only, and they don't bother with the video camera even though they could. Um, so, so I think that that, that range of choices um, it will always be open and people will vary in, 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 how, in how they use them. But on the other hand, there are lots of things about the way that we like to communicate with each other. This is particularly true when we're doing something more than just saying, damn, miss the bus, it's raining, can I get a lift? Um, that when one actually wants to do more substantive things, where what you, exactly what you lose is the messages and the, um, the signals that you send by tone and by body language and gesture. And in those settings where it's important, the ability to do that will drive a substantial use, I think. And, and so it may be that one slips into a mode of using it because it is as easy. And I don't think at the moment that, I mean, you're right, that you could use Skype or you could text, it is significantly more complex and, and actually less reliable to use Skype than to ping a text. And it probably isn't worth it for what you sent with the text. But if you were going to write a long text or a long email, you might just speak it or you might actually just speak to each other more. And so it would displace some things, but it won't necessarily displace all of them. I'm not suggesting it vanishes, but I am saying that as it becomes a major activity rather than a minor activity, it will have significant implications for the way we do stuff. I agree we'll get, it will grow, but I just think that the trend is towards asynchronous communication rather than synchronous for a lot of things. Uh, it doesn't, but it doesn't have to be, I mean, it doesn't have to be synchronous for you to use audio and video. I mean, if I wanted, if I wanted to send you a message where I felt that my personal presence, my tone and my body language and my gestures mattered, at the moment I couldn't really effectively do that asynchronously, whereas actually I might just get my phone out, I might just put it on, camera looks at me, and I might speak to it and go bang, and you get 20 seconds of me telling you something or explaining something um, that I couldn't have done very effectively with a text. So I think in some instances it, you, will still, you will use it for asynchronous as well as for synchronous. It's a prediction, let's see. Okay, if there aren't any more questions, then we've got 10 minutes for lightning strike for discussing, then lunch, and then back here at 2. Forward to seeing you all then, and thank you very much again. Thank you.